Good, good morning. morning. We'll try that again. And hopefully they get me going here because I'm going to need to be at the communion table in a little bit. But, uh, so let me know what you want to do. But welcome to worship as we gather here today. We want to uh, say welcome to you, especially who are uh, a guest with us this morning. As you can tell, it's July 1st and it's the July 4th uh, weekend in a sense. And uh, so lots of people are gone. We'll have a few more come in for worship time uh, as we move along here. But uh, we're glad that you are here today. We are glad that you are here to worship God and give thanks to him for the freedom that he gives us in Christ as we'll celebrate through the communion meal. And we're thankful as well for the freedoms that he gives us as we live here in these United States and we celebrate those freedoms this week uh, during July 4th. Uh, but as we begin our time of worship today, I just want to call your attention to uh, the uh, worship guides, and there you'll find uh, a connect card that is attached to it. It has a perforated line across it. If you would just take a moment and uh, put your name there and uh, uh, put those in the offering basket as they pass a little bit later. We want to pray for you. If you have a prayer concern that you would like us to pray for this week, uh, as a staff, please put those there as well. If you're a guest with us, we want to encourage you to put a, uh, an address or uh, an email address uh, so that we can send you your greetings from our church family uh, this week. And if you're a guest, we want to encourage you to stop by the Connection Center on the way out at the end of the service. Uh, and uh, we have a gift that we'd love to give to you to say thanks for being with us today. As we uh, enter into our time of worship, I want to invite the uh, uh, people who are going to be new members in our church. Join, come on up, and uh, why don't you stand over here since this is not working. I can't come down here with you, but come on up. And, and We have here John and Sue Dupree, as you can see on the pictures, and Bill and Laurie Oosting, and then Paul and uh, Sue Hershey, uh, who are joining our church today. And uh, these people have discovered uh, the church to be a place of nurture and growth and a place where uh, they sense the support of others. Uh, so that they can grow in their relationship with Jesus Christ. And so they are desiring to join with us to share their unique gifts that God has given them. And, uh, and so as they do, I want to say to you uh, these words from Ephesians 2 in the Apostle Paul, where Paul says, you are no longer strangers, you are no longer foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family, and we are built, we are his house, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We who believe are carefully joined together, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. And through him, you are also joined together as a part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. Those are great words for you today from the scripture. And I want to say to the six of you that we thank God for you. We thank God that he has made you a part of his church family, his universal church, through your coming to faith in him. And we thank God as well that he's led you to unite with this part of the universal church, this smaller part of the church of Jesus Christ called Forest Park Covenant Church. And so as you join with us, I want to invite you to affirm your faith by answering these questions. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your savior? and promise to follow him as Lord. If so, would you say, I do? You've made a public confession of your faith and you've been baptized. Do you accept the Holy Scriptures, the Old and New Testament, as the word of God and the only perfect rule for our faith and our doctrine and our conduct? If so, would you say, I do? Do you intend to live among God's faithful people to hear his word, to share in the Lord's Supper, to proclaim the good news of God through Christ, in our word, and in your deeds, and to strive for justice and peace in all the earth? If so, would you say, I do? I do. And do you promise to support the ministries of Forest Park Covenant Church, including the conference and denomination to which we belong? If so, would you say, I do? The responsibilities of church membership do not just rest on these six alone, but they also rest on those of us who welcome them into our family. And so if you as a part of this church are willing to welcome them with joy 
and pledge your love and support and your friendship and your prayers to them and your encouragement to them to grow in their faith, in their journey with Jesus Christ. Would you now as a congregation and as a church family say to them, we will. We will. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace that restores our relationship with you that was broken by our sin. And we thank you that you bring us into a relationship with each other and with the wider church. And we thank you for the relationship you bring us into here in this church family. And so, Father, we pray that you would fill these six and, and that you would fill all of us with your Holy Spirit so together we can be your people in this congregation who love and who accept each other and who form this community of Christ followers that love each other in such a way that the world would know we are your people. And so we pray for this, and we now thank you for these six who join us on this Communion Sunday. We thank you that we will be able to share this meal together as a part of this church family. And we pray for the rest of this service and that your blessing would be upon us in Jesus' name. And all God's people in agreement said, amen, amen. Would you welcome them into the church family? Kids, please, come. You don't know me, but yeah, come on, hey. <laughs> so I'm not Sandy Hervo. Sandy Hervo normally does this. Sandy Hervo is much better at it than I am. Yet, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, uh, 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 the way you can do this too. Uh, I poked Sandy one day and told her, uh, uh, Sandy, hey, wouldn't it be fun if we sang the one song that I know from when I was in children's church? And she said, oh, that's a really neat idea. And then Sandy went on vacation. And then I got voluntold, so here we are. <laughs> so guys, we're gonna sing Pharaoh, Pharaoh. Why don't you guys jump on up here? And we're gonna sing Pharaoh, Pharaoh. This was my favorite song from when I was in children's church because in the third verse, there's one line that I had a lot of fun with. So we're gonna all play around with that. So church, uh, church family, if you would please stand with me. Thank you. Now limber up, get a good little stretch. Okay, welcome to my classroom. You can all refer to me as Mr. Morales. Thank you. There will be a test at the end. <laughs> for the chorus, for the chorus, uh, we will repeat the chorus two times, uh, three times during the song, but twice each operation. Uh, it goes, Pharaoh, Pharaoh, oh baby, let my people go. Huh, okay, very important, very important, right? So again, Pharaoh, Pharaoh, oh baby, let my people go. Huh. Yeah, 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 right? So, Louie, Louie, you got it, right? Uh
dead man flow. And our friends from Teen Challenge are here, so we are going to be blessed by their presence. So Pastor Darren and your team, you may come on up and lead us in some worship. Good morning. Come on, we can do better than that. Good morning. Good morning. Amen. It is a blessing to be here um, with Teen Challenge, a ministry that is so dear to my heart. Uh, it's a ministry that I'm passionate about. Uh, I'm truly passionate about helping men and women um, with struggles of addiction and alcoholism uh, free themselves, not just from that, but to do it by having a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so we are always blessed to be here. This is, I told him, we're going to my church. Amen. Amen. And, 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 and listen, and, and I'm proud to say that because I know how passionate this church is about Teen Challenge and about so many other organizations in our community that, 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 that we are servants to. You know, we, we help so many people who struggle with so many things in life. And I am so blessed to be a part of a church that is about ministry because that is ministry when we're helping our community. So just, I, I'd just like to uh, say a few things about Teen Challenge and then we're going to uh, sing a couple songs. Uh, Teen Challenge is a recovery program and is focused on the Holy Spirit. Uh, it teaches of Christ and it gives our students a guiding light. Through Christ, our students are able to form a stronger connection with their faith, who makes a, which makes a huge difference in their recovery. We're not like any secular rehab. We don't believe once you're an addict, you're always an addict or alcoholic. Nor do we believe it's a disease like you hear on TV. We believe it's a sin problem. As a matter of fact, there are many scriptures that put drunkenness in the same verses as uh, adultery, fornication, idolatry, hatred. So we believe it's a sin problem. We believe Jesus is the answer. Uh, we provide a faith-based environment that encourages healing uh, and a new life in Christ. Uh, one of our main uh, scripture texts is 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. We believe that once you accept Christ, you don't ever have to go back to that old way of life. I'm going to say that again. You don't ever have to go back to that old way of life. You can live new and free in Christ Jesus. We have an 86% success rate. That is huge. Seven to eight years after men and women graduate our program, 86% of them are still clean and sober. And that's wonderful, and that's great. But I think the most exciting part of that is, is that they have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Is that they're not only clean and sober, but they're helping other people have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Pastor Phil McLean is our, is our founder. He is our director. Um, he uh, established Western Michigan Teen Challenge 48 years ago. And I've had many conversations with some of you here who knew him back then and, and knew when this ministry got off the ground. And so we're grateful for uh, Pastor Phil McLean, who is still actively working faithfully in our ministry. Amen. Over the years, this program has helped thousands of individuals overcome their life-controlling problems and become productive members of society. But how many of us know that nothing in life is free? Amen? But salvation. Amen. Amen. But, but living on this earth, it costs the ministry about $850 a month to house, to feed, and to train our students. Most of our students who come in can't afford this cost. And so that's why it is so important, and we're so grateful that churches like Forest Park open up their doors to us so that we can just share, and we, you know, we, 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 we operate, and we live, and we're blessed by your many donations individually and as a church, which helps this ministry go forward. Because we're not government funded. We don't get any help from the government. We 
do not accept any insurance. Blue Cross, Medicaid, Medicare, we don't accept any of that. So we are, uh, we, we function off of donations, off of the love and support of churches such as this one. And so for that, we say thank you to you. We have a table that will be out in our gathering, and please feel free to come get some materials. Uh, we have wristbands. We have CDs out there. Please, by all means, come and, and, and not only look at our table, but also talk to our brothers because they're going to be out there as well uh, just to share with you and talk with you if, you if that's what you want to do. So with that, I'm done, and now we're going to sing. Not because I've been so faithful, not because I've been so good. You've always been there for me to provide my every need. You were there when I was lonely. You were there in all of my pain. And God my footsteps, a shelter from the rain, and it was you, you made my life complete, you are to me my everything, that is why I sing, Jesus I love you. Because you care, I couldn't imagine if you weren't there. Jesus, I love you. my salvation you're the peace in my storm your loving arms protect me you shelter me from harm you are alpha and omega the beginning and the end you're my strong tower my dear and best friend and it was you you made my life complete you are to me my everything and that is why I sing Jesus I love you Imagine that you were in there. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. Because you care. Because you care. I couldn't imagine. I couldn't imagine. If you were in there.
Okay, I guess I'm giving my testimony right now. I'm a little nervous. Um, my name is Aaron. I'm uh, 36 years old. I'm from Grand Rapids, Michigan. And uh, I really was uh, contemplating what I'm going to say today in front of all these people. <laughs> but um, I guess. <laughs> Amen. I, uh, I guess I get to the root of. Uh, my uh, sinning problem. I, um, my mom committed uh, suicide when I was 15 years old. And um, instead of uh, somebody handing me a Bible, they handed me something to drink and uh, substances. So I was dealing with my pain uh, with, uh, not with God, but with, uh, with substances and uh, treating it the wrong way. And um, when I, that's what I'm learning how to do at uh, Teen Challenge is just deal with my pain in uh, the correct way. And that's uh, cast all your cares onto the Lord, you know, and that's what I'm doing. So, uh, um, amen. I uh, just, wanted, just wanted to share that with y'all. Um, I, I don't want to be uh, long in front of y'all, so. I'm going to keep it short. Amen.
Good morning, Forest Park. My name is Eugene. I'm 47 years old, and I used crack cocaine for 25 years. Um, I grew up in a Christian home. Um, my mother is an evangelist, preacher. She was all over the country in every um, Baptist convention that you could think of, women's auxiliary. She was leading it, and my father was the commander in chief of the East Chicago, Indiana Police Department. So I was a PK kid, <laughs> policeman's kid and a preacher's kid. And, <laughs> and um, you know, with that comes a lot of responsibility. It comes with a lot of um, pressure. And so a lot of the kids didn't like me because of who my parents were or where I lived and things of that nature. And um, I was sheltered. Uh, I was at church whenever the doors opened um, on Sundays throughout the week. I was very active in church at an early age. I was in the 100 Voice Children's Choir, and uh, things just turned dark for me. Um, at the age of 10, I was molested by one of the lieutenants on my father's police department, and that went on for a couple years, and that um, took me down some places, you know what I'm saying, and I, I just got an anger. I developed an anger and for God. I was, I was angry. I was why would you let this happen? Why would you let this continue? And then I was angry at my dad for, you know what I'm saying, having this person in our life. And it was just a lot of confusion at that age and a lot of um, pain, um, hurt, pain. And so that, after that, um, I started drinking. I started drugging um, marijuana, alcohol, and that eased the pain for a little while. And then I saw that um, when I was under the influence of those chemicals, I felt like a different person. And so... Uh, the kids seemed to like me, and I seemed to fit in, and so I started using on a regular basis just to fit in, and I became um, one of those I started to people please, trying to please my friends or please the people that I thought were my friends or the people that I thought I wanted to be like and be around, and that escalated and less escalated throughout high school. Um, by the end of high school, on my way to college, I had started using cocaine, and then um, the Bible says in First John, do not l love the world or the things in it, um, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And that's what happened. I became consumed with the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, um, seeing in all its sinful cravings. Uh, you name it, I fell into it. Um, and that went on throughout college. And that went on for a while until my parents decided and saw that I had some issues and some problems. And then they were like, OK, well, we backing off. We're going to let you go your way. And that's when I stepped into life to, um, to meet those needs that you know, my family was supplying and they were enabling for years. And the life of crime, of course, led me to jails, um, institutions. I got to a place where I was so hurt, so angry, so painful that I just wanted to end it all. I didn't even want to live anymore. Um, at an early age, like I said, I was in church, so I confessed to know the Lord Jesus, but my belief in God, I didn't believe that God could deliver me and could heal me from all of the things that I had been through and could save me from myself. And so I continued in a life of crime that led to prison bids, been to prison a few times, um, a couple uh, suicide attempts. Needless to say, um, I was just in a place of desolation, um, bondage. The devil had me. And um, I was asleep the other night and I, I thought about how this has been going on for so long, and I just thought about um, how God can use anybody and how he can bring anybody out of whatever they're in. Um, and I'm just grateful today. I, in August of 2016, I was facing 35 years in prison. I was arrested for some criminal things, um, and I woke up in the county jail, and when I woke up there, I was like, what happened? And when it got to reading off my charges and everything, I was just like, Lord, have mercy. Help me, not only to get out of this here 35 years, but help me with my life. I'm 46, at that time I was 46 years old, I was like, I can't continue to live this life. Um, I can't continue to hurt myself, because that's who I was hurting. I was hurting myself because of something that somebody else had done to me, because of the anger that I had, and I just kept, it just was 
to a place where I was like, okay, Lord, take this away, please. I got on my knees, I prayed, I went to Bible study, I, I did all of that while incarcerated. And I had a great attorney, thank God. Um, and she, led, she was led to Teen Challenge. And when she was led to Teen Challenge, she sent me some information on it and she linked me with Pastor Darren. And he was at that time the intake director and I called him um, from jail and I was asking him some questions and he was telling me about the program and I, he sent me a packet and I looked at the rules and the regulations and I was like, I can't do this. <laughs> I was like, there's no way I would be able to do a year program with all these stipulations. Um, and the judge that I had, he had some uh, court appointed programs and I could have got into those, but the more I thought about it, the more I prayed about it, God showed me that Teen Challenge was a place for me because it was gonna allow me to get back to my first love. It was gonna allow me to get connected with God. It was gonna allow me to kill and crucify this flesh that has kept me sick and suffering for so many years. And so, um, thank God I made it to Teen Challenge in July of 2017. When I went to sentencing, the judge looked at me and he said, I don't know why I'm doing this. He said, first of all, Teen Challenge, you're not a teen. <laughs> and what is this about? And so he said, um, but whatever it is, he said, I don't know why I'm doing this, but instead of giving you the 35 years that you deserve, I'm throwing 32 out, and I'm gonna give you three year sentence, one year to be completed at Teen Challenge, and two years suspended probation. So I know that God is able, I know that God is powerful. So I have been at Teen Challenge 11 and 11 months and some change. I will graduate August the 2nd, and I am just so grateful. <laughs> I'm grateful for what Teen Challenge has given me. It's given me my life back. It's given me the opportunity to, uh, to just love myself again, to be able to love others, to um, be able to put away all of that foolish stuff um, and just know that God is transforming me. He is moving in my life. He has a calling for me. I know that, and I ran from it for years, but um, I'm just grateful uh, to the program, grateful for the pastoral staff, for all that they pour into us on a daily basis. My scripture that I hold on to is Psalms 107. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. And the B side of that says, and let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. And he has definitely redeemed me. And I just thank you for hearing my testimony and thank you all for supporting Teen Challenge. God bless you. To God be the glory. Let's take a moment to stand and pass the peace among the body of Forest Park this morning. I'm going to do short communion. <laughs> oh, the grace of God. The grace of God that sets us free. We think of freedom this week because it's July 4th week. And we give thanks to God today on this July 4th weekend, in a sense, as we head into the celebration for those freedoms that we have, those physical freedoms that we have by living here in these United States. And we, thankful, we are thankful to God today for those who through the centuries have given so much of themselves, some who have given it all so that we could worship here today in freedom. But as we've heard this morning, there's an even greater freedom. And that greater freedom comes through Jesus Christ, who said in the Gospel of John chapter 8, when the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. And we have heard that this morning, and we celebrate that this morning in this communion meal, because this is what has led to your freedom and mine spiritually from the sin in our life. It is the broken body of Christ on the cross. Amen. 
and the blood of Christ shed on the cross. Taking on your sin and mine. Taking on the consequences of your sin and mine. So that we would no longer be in bondage as we heard just a few moments ago. So that we would be free. I want to encourage you here this morning, if you are one who has heard these testimonies and you sense that you just don't, you don't have that relationship with Jesus. Would you in these next moments, as the elements are distributed, before you take communion, settle that with him and invite Christ to forgive you of your sin and come into your life and set you free. The Apostle Paul on the night when he was betrayed said that, or the Apostle Paul said that Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, Jesus took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he said, this cup is the new covenant of my blood poured out for you. Drink all of it. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim my death for you that sets you free until I come again. Let's pray together. Oh, God of mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you in our thoughts, in our words, in our deeds. We've sinned against you by what we've done and at times by what we have left undone. And there are moments in our life where we have not loved you with our whole heart and we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. God, we are truly sorry for that and we humbly repent. And we pray that for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, that you would have mercy on us and you would forgive us. And God, as we confess our sin to you and we are reminded that if the sun sets us free, we are free indeed. We thank you for this table and that we can come to it, trusting not in our own righteousness, but in your great mercy. God, thank you for that mercy. And we pray that as we eat this bread and we drink this cup together, we would be reminded of your grace for us. That we would be reminded that you bring us together into a relationship with you. And that as we share this meal together, we are in relationship with each other. Those of us together who have experienced your love and your mercy and your forgiveness. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. As the servers serve communion this morning, we remind you that the bread and the cup are together in the one tray. And we invite you to take the tray, pass it to the person next to you, and then let them hold it while you receive. And then we invite everyone to hold the elements together until all have been served so that in an act of our unity together as brothers and sisters in Christ, we will share this meal with one another.
The body and the blood of Christ, broken and shed for you and for me. Take and eat and drink. Let's join our hearts together in prayer. Oh God, we are so thankful for the grace that sets us free. Free from our sin and free from all that keeps us from our relationship with you. Lord, your word says that all of us have sinned and fall short of your glorious standards, but that you, God, love us so much that while we were still sinners, you sent your son Jesus to die for us. And we are thankful for that. And God, as we thank you today for that spiritual freedom, we thank you as well for the physical freedoms that we are given in this country. And on this week when we celebrate that, when we celebrate the freedoms we have in this nation, we give you thanks for those who gave of themselves, who sacrificed themselves for service to us. And we thank you for those who, like you, Jesus, gave the supreme sacrifice, the sacrifice of their life, that we could be free physically, just as you, Jesus, sacrificed your life so we could be free spiritually. Father, we thank you for that. And God, on this week, we pray for our nation. We pray for our nation that is so divided and so filled with violence and hatred. Lord, we think of what took place in Maryland this week with another shooting. We think of families across our country, communities that have been impacted in recent years by by violence and by hatred. And we pray for those communities. And God, we think of communities across our nation as well that are impacted by division and by racial division, political division, ethnic division, socioeconomic division, so much that divides us. And we pray for our nation, we pray for communities, and we pray, Jesus, for the church, the church of Jesus Christ, that we would lament and we would weep for our nation, and that you would use us, O God, to make a difference that we, your people, here in this country, as we celebrate our freedoms this week, would use our freedom to tell others about the healing power of Jesus Christ. And Jesus, we pray that as we share that with others, they would see it in our lives and, and, and that you would heal divisions within churches across our nation because, God, at times the church reflects our country instead of reflecting you. And so we pray that we as a church and that churches across this nation would come together and that people would love each other and that the world would know that we are Christians by our love. We pray that you would use us, O God, to make a difference through the power of your Holy Spirit. And we thank you for those who are in unfamiliar places to them, who've left home to make a difference in their world and in the world around us. And we lift up before you today William and Don Owens as they serve in the Kentucky mountains. And we lift up Bob Johnson, who's going to Asia. And who'll be there these next couple months teaching English. But more than that, influencing others through the love that you have for them. God, would you use these and so many others in churches around our nation and our world to make a difference, we pray. And this morning, we especially thank you for the way in which you're using the ministry of Teen Challenge to make a difference. And we thank you for their ministry. And we pray that as we've heard the testimonies today and as we've celebrated and shared that with them, that you would continue to bless them and move upon them and use them in the lives and the hearts of people. God, we pray for these things. 
And we ask you to be at work in our church and in our community, in our nation, in our world, according to your grace and your will. And all God's people in agreement said, Amen. 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 We have so much to be thankful for today, for God's love and grace and mercy on us. Let's in an act of thanksgiving and gratitude to him, give back to him a part of all that he's given to us. Ushers, would you please come and receive from us our offerings. I have a home, eternal home, but for now I walk this broken world. You walked it first, you know our pain, but you show hope can rise again up from the grave. Abide with me, abide with me, don't let me fall and don't let go, walk with me and never leave, ever close, God above. Gethsemane before the cross before the nails overwhelmed alone you prayed you met us in our suffering and bore our shame abide with me abide with me don't let me fall and don't let go. Walk with me and never leave. Ever close, God, abide with me. Oh, love that will not end. Kids, you can come on forward for your blessing. Adults, you may be seated. Please join me in praying for our children today. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing the children to our church. Thank you for giving us this responsibility to teach them, to grow them. I pray for them when they go to class. They're going to learn about Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. They're going to learn about um, the story of them being tested. And I pray, God, that you would just help them remember that um, you are with them no matter where they are, in the good times and the bad, even like you were with those men in the fiery furnace. God, help our children grow in confidence of you. Remember that you are always in their hearts if they find you. God, I pray for the whole children's wing. I pray that your presence is among them with the teachers, with all the children. Help these um, children to be transformed. Um, help their hearts and minds grow in you. In your name we pray. Amen.
And do you look for someone to bring to Christ? I think that's a pretty important question. Um, but notice I didn't say, do you look for someone to bring to church? Different thing there. There's nothing wrong with inviting people to come to church. There's nothing wrong with wanting people to know uh, that the church home that you're proud of and, and inviting people to come. But unfortunately, sometimes what happens is, is that when we invite them to church, if they're unsaved, sometimes they leave unsaved. And so Jesus, I believe his message was not for us to invite people to church. I believe his message was to invite people to Christ. I believe the message is for us to go and to share the good news as we're going to look at today just very briefly. Scripture, all through Scripture, he tells us to go and share the good news. I'm, I'm blessed to be a part of this awesome ministry team challenge. And you've heard the testimonies and you've heard what God is doing in the lives. You all know me that I was a student at Teen Challenge and, and what God done for me. But the reality of this great ministry is that these men and women who choose to come to Teen Challenge, they choose to. They come to Teen Challenge because they want to change their life. Now, that's a wonderful thing, and, 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 and it's a blessing for us to, to know that. But everyone is not going to make the decision to, to come to Christ on their own. Everyone is not going to make that decision. Everyone is not going to come to church. I'm pretty sure some of us today here in the audience didn't come to Christ on their own. Amen? But we was led through someone. Someone reached out to us and shared Jesus with us. We could have been so far from Christ and, and not even thinking about going to church, and somebody reached out to us. Because here's, here's how I believe the pattern should work, is that when you get a relationship with Jesus Christ, you want to come to church. You want to fellowship with those who, 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 are, who you have a, a common interest with, and that's Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, Jesus knew this when he penned the, the scripture called the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 19 and 20 says, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. The key word there is go. We have a responsibility to go. He tells us in Luke 10, uh, uh, one, 1 and 2, the Lord now chose 72 other disciples and sent them ahead in pairs to all the towns and places he planned to visit. And then he says a familiar passage of scripture that we all know that the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So we pray to the Lord who's in charge of the harvest and we ask him to send more workers into the fields. That's not a sit back and wait command. That's a go command. That's a charge for us to go. He tells us in Acts 1, very similar, Jesus says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We are to go, whether it's next door or in our own family, or another country as missionaries, but we are commanded, brothers and sisters, to go. To go and find those. Scripture in King James says, in the highways, in the byways, we are to go and impale those to come to Jesus. We are to go and share what God has done for us. That's why I love Teen Challenge, because wherever we go, people are impacted, not just by the singing, not just by the word being preached, but by the testimonies of what God is doing if we would just let him. So, do you look for someone to bring to Christ? Scripture not only teaches that we should go, but it also teaches us we should look for the lost. Luke 15, Jesus tells of the parables of the lost sheep and the lost coin. 
He says, if, if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go search, look intensely for the one that is lost until he finds it? And then when he finds it, he puts it upon his shoulder and he brings it back to the flock. There's something about us looking intensely for those that are lost. The woman who had the the, 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 the ten silver coins and she lost one. Scripture says, won't she light a lamp and sweep the entire house and search and look intensely until she finds it? Both of these are parables of how we should be as Christians. When it comes to the lost, we come to seek. As a matter of fact, Luke talks about, in, uh, Jesus talks about in Luke when, 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 he in, when he encountered Zacchaeus up a sycamore tree. Verse 10 says, he came to seek and to seek and to seek and to, and seek and to save those which was lost. So we should search for the lost. Look intensely for those we know that do not have a relationship with Jesus. So our scripture text today paints a great picture of how we as Christians should look for people and bring them to Christ. If you have your Bibles, go with me to John chapter 1. It will be on the screen for us. John chapter 1, and we're going to read verse uh, 40 through 42a, and then we're going to read Verses 45 and 46, and and, and I'll be done. Verse 40 says, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of those men who heard what John said and then followed Jesus. Andrew went to find his brother Simon and told him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. Then Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus. Something powerful stood out to me when I was studying this verse. Once Andrew accepted the the testimony of John the Baptist about Jesus, he immediately went to look for and tell his brother Simon Peter. Once he had an understanding of Jesus and that the Messiah had come and that this is who they was looking for, when, when he had the privilege and the honor to be acquainted with Christ, He was in a position to be an instrument to go get his brother and bring him to Jesus. And I believe that 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 responsibility or that privilege and honor was not just for Andrew. That's for us, too. Listen, when Jesus has done so many great things in our life and he's delivered us and he has saved us and he has reunited us and he has restored us. We want we have to go tell somebody about what Jesus has done. We know the type of world we live in today. There's so much hopelessness. There's so much despair. There's families that are divided on a daily basis. There's marriages that are failing on a daily basis. And I'm just saying, if God have done something for us, if he's intervened, if he's made a difference, we ought to go tell somebody how good God is. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 20 tells us that God has made us his ambassadors. <laughs> I love that. What, what does an ambassador of a country do? He represents the country. Like, so, 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 if we, so if we had the ambassador of Africa in America, he represents Africa in America. And so can I tell you, that's, that's just powerful to me because we live in a, this is, the scripture says, we're just pilgrims <laughs> passing through this barren land, which means we're not meant to stay here. So guess what? Because we're not meant to stay here, we are ambassadors for Christ. Ambassadors for what? Corinthians says that we have been given the task of reconciling people back to him. We have the ministry and the message of reconciliation, and that is to go look for people and help them come to know who Jesus is. Can I get a hearty amen? Amen. Jesus, after Jesus has delivered us and after Jesus has healed us, after Jesus has saved us, our response should be as striking as Andrew. 
Go tell somebody. I got to go get somebody and tell them about this Jesus. See, because one other thing I've learned about working at Teen Challenge is that we get brothers that come in, and, and one of the comments is, is, I wanted to change. I wanted to be delivered. But I didn't know how. I didn't know how to get to Jesus. And so we are the road map, if I could say. We are the ones that, that, that help them navigate themselves to Jesus Christ. His first concern was for his brother. I love that about Andrew. He, didn't go, he went right to his brother. His first concern was his brother so he could know who Jesus was. As quickly as he could, after discovering Jesus for himself, Andrew rushed to find his own brother. Scripture teaches us this. Charity or love begins at home. I believe the first place we should begin to look, <laughs> the first place we, sh we should begin to search for people to come to Christ is in our own families, to our close circle of friends, to those that we have influence over. Verse 42, after Andrew looked for his brother and found him, he brought him to Jesus. He didn't just tell him about him. He brought him to him. Listen, I want you to have the same experience that I've had. I want you to know him just like I know him. I believe Andrew understood that to show his true love for his brother was to introduce him to Jesus Christ. The bread of life, the living water, the savior of souls, the son of God. That's our job. If we truly love people, we ought to be looking for them and bringing them to Christ. We should, with a genuine concern and love, seek the spiritual welfare of those that we love. When we have tasted that God is gracious, we should not rest until those we love have tasted him too. That's our job. Verse 45 and 46 says, Philip went to look for Nathanael and told him, we have found the very person Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nazareth, exclaimed Nathanael. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Come and see for yourself, Peter replied. We look at Andrew and Simon, family members, family relationship, how one family member sought another family member so that they can know who Jesus was. But when we look at Philip and Nathaniel, we're looking at a friendship. <laughs> we're looking at friends, not family. Verse 43, Jesus goes to Galilee and finds Philip, and he says to him, come follow me. And then in turn, Philip goes to find Nathaniel. <laughs> his friend, to tell Jesus, to tell him about Jesus. Boy, we have to be excited about what God is doing in our life so that we can help others to be excited. I think that's why so many people don't come to Christ. Because some people in the church act like the people in the world. I'm talking about sometimes we act like there's no hope. Sometimes we are in despair. <laughs> just like them. So how can we encourage them and how can we help them come to Jesus if we're not excited about what God is doing in our life? We have to encourage them and help them be just as excited as we are. I can imagine Andrew running to Peter with excitement. We found the Messiah. I can imagine Peter running to Nathaniel. We, listen, we found the one that Moses was talking about. Come, see. Excitement. I believe that's key. Philip had the same love and concern for his friend to come to Christ as Andrew had for his brother Peter. And sometimes when we look and find someone to bring to Christ, you may even get a negative response. Because Philip got a negative response. <laughs> Nathaniel says, what good can come from Nazareth? 
You coming to get me talking about this, uh, he, this can't be the Messiah. He come from Nazareth. Somebody may say to you, I don't need to go to church. I don't even need Jesus. I'm doing pretty good myself. I'm doing all right. I got a good job. I got a career and I got a home. I got a family. Sometimes you'll get that negative response. Use wisdom and don't argue with people. As, as Philip, Philip didn't argue. He said, come, see for yourself. That's what you got to tell them. Tell them what God has done for you. A lot of times they can see what God is doing. They can see the deliverance. They can see the healing. And you don't have to argue your point. Just say, come, see what he can do. Jesus wants to show people personally what he can do in their lives. <laughs> we don't have to say a whole lot. Just introduce them to Jesus and let Jesus do the rest. I encourage you today, look for someone to bring to salvation. Look for someone to bring into a saving relationship with Jesus today. Jesus hung, bled, and died for that very reason, that we who are saved, we help him be kingdom builders by looking for someone else who needs Christ. Let's close in prayer together. God, we, we thank you for this word. We thank you for this morning where we have been so impacted by your love and your mercy and your grace. As we've heard the stories of how you've been at work in other people's lives, as we've celebrated at the table here how you have been at work in our life and how we've heard from your word as to how you want us to go from this place, to share that good news with others. God, would you instill what we have heard this morning into our hearts and lives so that we could go out and reach people, so that we could share with them the good news and say, I found the Christ, and I want you to find him too. God, we pray that for Forest Park today and tomorrow and in the years to come. In Jesus' name and through the power of your Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. Before we leave, I just want to say a word of thanks to you as a church family for all of the prayers that you have given to us as a family and for our grandson, Miles, who was born uh, three months prematurely. Uh, so many of you have been praying, and, uh, and Vanessa said uh, last week, she said, tell the people, she's down in Kansas with our daughter and with our grandson. He's going to be three months in the uh, NICU before he'll be able to come home. But she said, tell the people there, I so much feel their prayers. She is so sensing your prayers. I want to say thank you for that. And I want to say to God be the glory, because the other day the doctor came in and he said, I can't imagine a baby born at 28 weeks doing better than what this child is doing. Amen. Isn't that amazing? To God be the glory. And so thank you, God. Thank you for your prayers. I want to let you know that next Sunday, Pastor Mike Shabilsky is going to be here. Those of you who know Mike, who was our interim pastor back four or five years ago, he's going to be here to share the word with us. It's going to be a great time. want to encourage you to come back for that. And then want to let you know that on July 14th, Saturday, July 14th, at 2.30 in the afternoon at Hackley Park, there's going to be an event down there called Project 714. And this is an event that several Christian churches and groups are putting together. There's going to be music through the afternoon and evening. There's going to be activities and games. It's a huge family event down at uh, Hackley Park. There's no cost. Our worship team is going to be down there as well for some of that time. There's going to be different groups from different churches. It's going to be a great event for our community. That's on Saturday, July 14th. Hackley Park, 2.30. We'll make sure that some info comes out to you through the, uh, through the wiki as well as in the bulletin next week. But be aware of that. Reminder, too, that our prayer team is here at the front. Can I say to you today that if you are one who has been impacted by the words you've heard and you do not know Jesus, would you come here to the front and would you pray with these people and let them pray with you and receive Christ today? If you have another need as well, come take advantage of them here at the front. They're willing to pray with you for whatever it is you want prayer for. And now let us go and enjoy fellowship around the table and then going out into the world and see that sign going out that says we are now entering the mission field. Amen. 
Let's go and share Jesus with others. Mm -hmm.